Hey, everybody, welcome back to another wonderful episode of Profiting with Nonprofits, the podcast that takes you on a deeper dive into the wonderful world of nonprofit development. We sit down with marketers, social media experts, fundraisers, you name it. We've sat down and had great conversations with them because we've been doing this for about two years. And I can't believe it. Facebook just popped up on me and said, You've been doing this for about two years. You know, it all started with a Facebook live show because I was trying to create some new content for our agency. And two years later, we're sitting down with a really special guest we actually went over we went a little bit north of the border here today we're sitting down with a really wonderful person he came to me because he loved my show and he was interested in being on i said sure dude why not and we're sitting down with a fellow named Brandon Peacock. Brandon has a very interesting story, both as a founder of a nonprofit, but also as the, an expert in the, in the level of organic social media growth for community growth and development. And that's all we're talking about today, because everybody knows, especially now in 2024, everything's all about social proof and growing communities. And it's funny because communities are now, online communities are now starting to become a popular thing. But for anybody who remembers the internet before the internet was a thing, there were board, there were message boards boards and chat rooms and those were communities but brandon takes that to a whole nother level and we're going to sit down and learn a little bit more about his story because it's really interesting it's it's beyond interesting and how he grew his organization for in organically to be able to help the people he helps but before we hear about brandon's story i always like to do a little plug here um, this podcast is proudly sponsored by give suite your all-in-one nonprofit solution for small and medium organizations we're looking to elevate the community accelerate their monthly giving through the power of fundraising marketing donor management and so much more give suite offers you a full collection of tools that are there to help your organization thrive without breaking the bank if you're looking to learn more about give suite you can schedule a strategy session with me today and we'll sit down and understand what your organization is looking for lacking and how we can fix that problem and how gifts we can be there to help you. So without further ado, nobody cares about me, as I always say. Let's hear about Brandon. Brandon, what's good, homie? Welcome to the show. Hey, I appreciate you having me on, Sean. I uh, Obviously, I love a lot of the work that uh, you do. I know we've talked a little bit behind the scenes, and, and we've got a lot to talk about here. But um, yeah, t- tons of love for the work that you're doing. I think that uh, the not-for-profit world is due for let's say a little bit more uh, modernization and, and you're doing a pretty good job at, uh, at helping good people win, which is what, uh, what it's all about. So yeah, big fan for what you do. Amazing. Amazing. So, so tell me a little bit more, tell what, first of all, you have a very interesting story and it, it, how you got into this whole nonprofit <clears throat> world. And so what's your, tell your story to people. I mean, I know it and I was blown away by it and that's how it kind of spiraled out into your organization. So what's your deal? Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely it's it's probably a different founder story than than most in the not for profit space. Though I think not for profit organizations often have the most remarkable stories. Um, I started my charity uh, after I got shot three times in a drive by shooting as a bystander. So before the shooting, I went to university. My my long term plan as a kid was actually to be a corporate lawyer. Um, from the time I was like six years old, that's where I thought I was going to be in life. Uh, It's where my parents told me I wanted to be. I never shut up. So they just assumed like lawyer, boom, he's going to be the kid to, you know, make all the money in the family. We're pushing him that way. Um, 18 years old, I ended up working at the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, Funny enough, became friends with a lot of the Supreme Court justices as like literally a kid, like an 18 year old kid. And it was through one of those justices that I actually realized I hated the law. And he long story short. Because it's Canadian. Because it's Canadian. That was a whole different thing. Um, but when I was talking to this justice, I was actually just helping him move out of his office. He was leaving the bench at the time and he looked at me and we were talking about, you know, my future and all that stuff. And he's just like, Hey man, like, like serious question for you. Do do you love the law? And I looked at him like perplexed. No one had ever once asked me that. I didn't think you were supposed to love the work that you did. I thought you were just supposed to show up, work hard and make money. Right. And I realized in that moment, like, Oh my, like, no, what, what do you mean? People could love the work that they do. Um, so there and there, I basically threw away my legal dreams, decided that, you know, this isn't the path for me. And he kind of ushered me, you know, he said, if you don't love the work that you do, if you don't love the law, you're going to hate the rest of your life. <laughs> and um, so I went back to school, focused kind of on the business side of things, came out of my degree working as a corporate consultant uh, at 23 years old. I'm do living what I think is the dream working in, you know, the consulting field, going out for drinks every week, taking out clients, doing all that fun stuff. 
And then I get shot three times as a bystander, literally walking in to get my haircut uh, for my corporate job so I could look professional. <laughs> um, so as I'm walking into the barber shop, two cars rip up. They start opening fire on the door that's being held open for me. The target of the shooting actually runs through the door. So there was a target. It was gang related. I just happened to be in the way of the target they were trying to get because this shooting happened at 5.45 p.m. in broad daylight um, in Canada, where I guess gun violence does happen. No one thinks it does, but it does not here. Um, but I was able to use my larger frame. I'm, I'm like 6'2", 190, and I was able to shield the woman who was holding the door open for me, launch the two of us into the shop. Uh, fortunately, she was safe, but I got hit three times. Um, so the first bullet hit me in the left side of the chest, which actually should have been a way bigger deal than it was, but it, it exited at about the top of my collarbone there and entered at the bottom of my left shoulder blade. So it hit my rib, broke like all of my ribs, but missed my heart and my lungs. So it wow. was like just the luckiest bullet that you could ever be hit by. Uh, if it was just that bullet that hit me, I would have been out of the hospital the next day. Second bullet hit me in the left knee. Uh, which was kind of just like a paper cut, honestly, not a big deal. And then the third bullet uh, severed my femoral artery in the right leg. So that is that not, was a bad one. That was a bad one. It's actually the second. It's it's one of the most deadly spots that you could get hit. I believe it's the second most deadly after the aorta in the neck. Um, but you're actually more likely to survive a bullet to the head than the femoral artery because you bleed out so so quickly, right? And you basically can't stop the bleed out even with compressions, unless you get a tourniquet on the leg, right? So where I was really lucky is four minutes into the shooting, I'm laying on the ground, literally bleeding out. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've called my mom. I've let her know what's happening. I've insured her I'm going to be okay. And um, an officer gets on the scene four minutes after me being shot, gets a tourniquet on my leg, and it gives me enough time to make it to the hospital where I found out had it been four minutes and 30 seconds that he got there, I would have probably been dead. Uh, so I like just made it with enough time to get to the hospital. Um, I went into surgery that night with a 50, 50 chance to survive and about a 10% chance to keep my right leg. Uh, fortunately surgeons here did a double fasciotomy and then they put me under an eight hours femoral bypass surgery. So they took a vein out of my left leg, replaced the artery in my right leg, saved my leg, saved my life and gave me a fighting chance at recovery. Um, and then after that, down the road, I recovered well and, and started my not-for-profit to help other trauma survivors access recovery resources to recover the same ways that I did. So a lot more uh, in that, but that's kind of a high level of uh, who I am and, and how the charity got started because I never in a million years thought I would be in the not-for-profit space. But honestly, now that I'm here, I, I absolutely love it. Wow. That is, holy crap, man. That that that's intense, but I mean, so 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 from that, you started your organization, and you said that you do a lot of your own, and so and you help a lot of trauma victims. And I saw your site, and it you're doing a lot of campaign like fundraising campaigns, and you said oh, most, if not all, of it comes from organic social. And you seem like you you said you mastered the kind of art of organic social, and especially in the nonprofit space where budgets are limited and, you know, people, everyone wants to be an influencer. Everybody wants to like, you know, sell you the next big thing to help you grow your organization. How, how do you leverage organic social to be authentic, to show people what you're doing, gain that social proof and turn it into money? Yeah, there, there's a lot of different ways, honestly. And I've, I've kind of tried a lot of different avenues, to, to be honest. Um, for me, I was able to learn. I have a best friend who owns a marketing agency. Um, so I was able to pick his brain quite a bit at the start of my recovery journey. And if there's one thing that stands out above all else that I, I think will literally determine whether or not your not for profit fundraises on social, it's how effective of a storyteller you are and how effectively you can showcase where the money coming in is making a difference, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the unfortunate reality of the not-for-profit world is there's definitely a lot of distrust, right? Mm -hmm. In where that money goes, where the spending goes. But what I've done effectively is <clears throat> I'll show, you know, we're fundraising, for example, right now, we're trying to fundraise $50,000 for a young man who was paralyzed, uh, shot as a bystander, similar to me, but it, it went differently than my situation. Uh, paralyzed, we're trying to fundraise $50,000 to put him through stem cell therapy. And next week, I'm sending my videographer to Columbia with him 
to go document his stem cell therapy treatments, right? And like showcase the actual hands-on work that we're doing. So it's that finding that balance of showing the story, creating the empathy and, you know, emotion attached to the work that you do, but then also tying it back in and bringing, you know, along the audience to show that like, yes, this horrible thing happened, we're fixing it, here's how you can be a part of it, right? So building that community is so important. If playing, not out playing is a weird word, but leveraging the emotional, you know, response of your audience is big, but really it's just documenting the social proof. And I, I think one of the things that I'm actually very passionate about on that topic too, because you kind of brought it up earlier, is like your goal isn't to be an influencer here. And I think a lot of not-for-profits do this really poorly where they try to play on trends. They try to like become influencers because they think mm. that's the best way to grow. But all that matters for your not-for-profit, it, it, your view count actually doesn't matter, right? Like views are only as good as how many people enter your funnel because of the views, right? Mm. So if you have, for oh. example, in, in one month, I had two videos, like a month separate, two videos that grossed like 4 million views, right? And one of them was totally unaffiliated with the charity. It was just like um, me talking about the shooting and we, we monetized a little bit, but a very small amount, right? Whereas I had one video storytelling about one of the kids that we're helping, we fundraised like $30,000 or $25,000, right? Like yeah. somewhere in that window. And it, it literally it's sense. because of story call to action, right? You need to have that call to action in every video, but also you need to, again, showcase the work and where the money's going like talk to these people just so simply um and you'll you'll be able to fundraise a lot more because there's good people out there and also they don't really care about tax receipts as much as you think they do like there's all these things that are like mm -hmm. misconceptions just show the work that you're doing and do it in a way that's human and goes from like pity like feeling bad for people to like i love this guy and i want to help him to how you can help Literally, if you follow those three steps, like eventually you will hit it big and fundraise effectively because other people out there care about the work that you're doing. Like if you're a not-for-profit, there is an audience out there for you who wants to support you. You just need to reach them like honestly. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen that with a lot of the campaigns we're running. Um, <clears throat> we actually just recently switched up one that we've been doing. And we we specifically did something like that, focused less on the 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 bigger picture of you know help that whatever, and drill down into who these people are and what their whole backstory is. And we've been you know it, it, creating the videos and having them talk about it blows it blows your mind. But it's all about social proof, and that's the thing. It's exactly, a lot of nonprofits screw this up so badly because they they do they're either outdated on their information their social media people are are interns that don't really have a clue what's flying and or they... i don't want to cut you off here but like they're not always interns that don't know what they're doing a lot of their time they're people who've gone through university but they've never built social pages right so Correct. they they're taught how to market without yes. ever having having done it effectively right Correct. and like there's a lot they, of things that you have to do outside of the textbook to effectively leverage mm -hmm. social media, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. it, again, there's brand guidelines. There's all these like little things yes. that I think actually crush Should not for profits. Yeah, but like, nonsense. dude, just just be a human. Literally, just yes. be a human yes. and tell a story. That's as simple as it is. Yeah. And people just don't do it. They're afraid to almost. It's they overcomplicate it. They way yep. overcomplicate it. One hundred percent. Like that. That's the. That's what I feel. Is like a lot of people. I mean, like in our agency, that like that's specifically the difference. I mean, like I don't. I don't care for rules. I don't care for like you know. You have to think outside of the box, and you have to like actually use your brain um, yeah. to fit and be creative. And like when you focus into on rules, and like it's like it's like when you see people on LinkedIn talking about the the secrets to success on LinkedIn. It's like no, just create content that people care about. Like. For, my, for example, my YouTube channel, I have 260 subscribers to my YouTube channel, but I make a lot of money off of my YouTube channel. How do I do yep. it? Because I create content that people actually care about. An organization, you could have like, you know, a small amount of people who actually follow your social pages, but you could have a, make a very big impact because you, let's, you, you're, you're giving people content and you're showing people what you're doing and you're giving them a reason to be connected to. That's why it's all about building communities is a huge thing. And like I said before in my intro, is that people are starting to get into this whole community space and like privatized communities. But these things have been around for ages and people just don't realize it. And community can be, you, you can take your community from offline to online 
It's just a matter of flipping the switch because if they're already working with you offline, they're connected to you, coming to your events and doing your doing your fundraisers and like you know selling the 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 chocolate bars on the street, you know, like whatever. They'll they'll cool. flip and do your online community too. And and what I almost want to like add on to that because I think it's an area that a lot of not for profit uh, founders miss out on is most small not for profits that I talk to most of their money that comes in like over sixty to seventy percent comes in from events right yeah events take a lot of time man they're, they're yep. really hard to run and uh-huh. there's there there's high cost of expenses like all of these things that we normalize right so if you rent out a venue and you do this stuff maybe you fundraise fifteen thousand dollars from event but it costs you you know five grand to run it right so you fundraise ten grand that's awesome that's a lot of time invested but when you get effective at social media fundraising it's all just your time and then the cost of like an editor right like these things your your margins decrease your time mm-hmm. invested decreases and you can actually just triple your output if you really wanted to and fundraise more effectively that way. Plus you don't limit yourself to a certain community, right? Correct. I was going through, so I, I consult um, with a couple of small charities right now on like, you know, social strategy. And one of the things I was looking at is if you go to my website right now and you look at our current campaigns and you look at recent donors, it's all over the world, man. Like I was looking at it today, the 10 donors that popped up, so we have like a rolling, you know, list of recent donors, Ireland, the UK, Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand, USA, and Denmark, right? All that's like eight out of the 10. Maybe there was three in Canada or whatever, because that's where I'm mostly based. But you don't like you open yourself up to a full audience of people around the world. And it's almost guaranteed that you're going to catch more people who deeply care about the work that you do if you if you expand on a global level right like that's what these social media algorithms are built for they want to get your content in front of people who connect with it because they want to keep you on their platforms longer right so it's it's so underutilized in today's world and and a big part of it is because people don't know how to use it effectively no 100 percent. and and this is why you when you do stuff on a global scale when you do when you're when you're opening yourself when you're not localizing yourself to an event and also events suck now like honestly events like, suck i mean meaning like i went to a event, an event a couple weeks ago in tel aviv and i thought it was going to be better than it was and i was hoping it, I, it, I was hoping there's gonna be more networking but it was like t- 10 speakers packed into 20 minutes like it was like it was it was it was just like too much information overload so especially the nonprofits, when you're doing fundraisers and galas and dinners and these type of things you're 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 putting you have you already have your overhead you have your high cost you're localizing yourself so you're limiting yourself to a specific market of people and it, it, at the end of the day what are you going to walk away with you know it's well, pretty much the you, same people who are always going to come to you but now like, you also just added a really important point too and like when you do these networking these galas these sp- specific events you're also really relying on your network, right? Yes. If you don't have a very, like a mm-hmm. high net worth network around you, Correct. running a not for profit is almost impossible if you're trying to yep. rely on your friends and family, right? Yep. Because even 100%. if you've got, you know, like and it, you need to, you need to cast the net wide, especially as like a young not for profit founder, man. Like, I don't know. I, I've got a few friends who've done well for themselves, but most of them I've met along my journey. Like if I had met them, like they're, they're all actually all come through through social media as where I found them all. Yeah. You know, like I, I had this conversation with somebody who I was doing some consulting with when he started his nonprofit. He had a great idea for an organization, but he, but he wanted to do the opposite. What we just talked about, go big events and this being this, but he didn't, but he didn't want to put in the work. I said, dude, your organization is all social based. All you have to do is literally sit on the toilet and, and create, run your Facebook group and run WhatsApp groups and just get people in and have the conversation and then, and then help them out and give them the, the resources that they need. All while you can do is five minutes a day while sitting on the toilet. And yep. he's like, yeah, but I want to be in the clinics. I want to be in this. And I was like, I was like, but you're, you're here in one country, everybody else where you want to do is over there. And there's people literally reaching out to you for help. And, you know, but it's like, that's the thing. Like, that's the beauty of this. A lot of stuff like what you're doing and what a lot of these small organizations are doing, at least to start, is everything social-based. And and as I told you before we started recording, you know, everything's based on strategy. You know, software is based on strategy. Marketing is based on strategy and understanding your markets, understanding your audiences. So you're not, you might not, TikTok might not be where your organization is supposed to be just because everybody else is doing TikTok. 
yeah. YouTube is, you know, Facebook, you have to understand your audience, understand your demographics and where the best bang for the buck is going to be and where you're going to be able to have the best communication and conversations with them and, and roll with it. And so even well, though and where you're, where your most conversions are going to come from too, right? It's important sure. like, to understand that, like just as a case study, TikTok is the platform I blew up on the most. Like I probably had, there, there was a one month window just as a, as a case study example, where I had a fundraising video for one of the kids I'm working with. He was shot as a bystander, uh, you know, paralyzed the, the whole gist. And we were fundraising to try to get him a standing machine, right? And we had this donation link. Now our website wasn't optimized for traffic at the time. So that could Ooh. be a caveat that excuse everything. But we had like five or 6 million views in like a one week window. And it worked out well because we found someone who donated a version of that standing machine to him. So we just had to like fly to him and drive it across the country. So like that worked out well. But donation wise, we only had like $560 in donations yep. come in and I'll, through, and I'll... through 5 million views. But, yep. but so where I'm going with this is we optimized our website for, for flow, right? Uh, in like after that. And the biggest, biggest changes we made were we had a, if you've probably seen our website now, a current campaign section where on the site you can donate directly. You see mm -hmm. like the bar barometer of progress we're making towards the goal. You see recent donations. Then you have the copyright down there of the individual story and basically where your money's going. And we also integrated Apple Pay into the checkout mm. model, right? And making those two changes, that was when we fundraised like twenty five to $30,000 in one month, right? It was actually really within like a two week window off of that viral video. So that's like a $25,000 difference basically just yep. by changing up. And again, the platform could be playing a role, right? Because I think on Instagram, it's what we consider an aspirational platform. So people are a little bit more connected to the content, whereas TikTok is a little bit more like educational is what it would be considered. Now, like there's a lot of brain rot content on there too, but yep. it's technically an educational platform. So like it could be different. Like people are scrolling. They're less likely to come check out your profile. Like there, there's other factors in play, but just making that website change was a $25,000 conversion difference. Right. And when social media is your main form of fundraising, that's a massive, massive deal. Right. Sure. Um, it, it's so a lot really goes cool. into it. Well, yeah, but that, that's, that's all what it comes down to. My entire methodology is funnel offer, follow up and frequency. If you have a good funnel, you have a good offer, you have a strong follow-up and you know your audience. So you're going to win at marketing. So in your case, you had, you had, you had, you knew your audience, you put it out, you got 5 million views. You had a good offer, which was donate to this guy's cause, but your funnel sucked and yep. your, and your follow-up, you weren't, you know, there was no follow-up. There's no retargeting. There was no, because you didn't, but when you made those tweaks, you saw a, a massive increase. And I tell yep. this to people all the time is that if you, if you have any of these pieces out of place, you're, you're going to flop miserably. And you saw case in point. Yep. And, and so it's all, but, but still you understanding where your audience is, understanding your audience is also huge understanding how, because each platform is a different type of conversation is a different type of message that you're going to relate. It's the same thing you're posting on TikTok might not convert as well as what you're posting on Facebook. The same thing you're posting on Facebook is not going to do this is not going to convert the same as Instagram and, yep. and so on and so forth. And everyone thinks that social media is all the same. Like you can just re schedule and re on everything and repost. It it's not going to have the same effect and people see it and people see through the bullshit. Well, and it depends too. So like one of the things, and, and again, there's some videos that will do well cross platform if they share like universal themes, right? So it's why you see some content creators specifically who become these like recognizable faces and right. get so popular, like the influencers. It's right. because they're just talking in like hyperbolic universal themes. So they yeah. get your attention, right? But then you follow them, right? And that stuff always translates like really, really like strong storytelling and a message that makes you feel some sort of like endorphin high when you're viewing. It's why you see these people out there who are like super big victims, let's say, like kind of complaining about everything in the world get really popular, right? Because they kind of create this us against them like narrative and that'll translate across all platforms. It, it does best on TikTok, but it'll do well on Instagram too. <laughs> Right. But if you go on Instagram and TikTok, for example, and you compare the two, what you'll see a lot of creators do is, like I said, aspirational versus educational. But if you go on Instagram, what you'll see is people use a lot of B roll, right? So they use a lot of videos of them actually out there fundraising, for example. Or in my case, it would be the kids at physiotherapy, like showcasing them actually doing the work in the clinic. 
And then it's me behind a computer screen fundraising. And like you show the story through visuals and through storytelling, whereas TikTok, it actually is more storytelling heavy. So if you have the right look and the right, uh, you know, tone, you can be a super effective, you know, um, influencer, uh, influencer on yeah. TikTok. Like, but it's, it's just the, the way that the platforms are set up is totally different. And then Facebook's a whole different world, right? It's so like what I would recommend for people just starting out, it's not the way that you're going to become the most successful, but a lot of people don't know where their content is going to track because they don't know their audience make one reel and throw it out on all the, all the other platforms. Like that's fine when you're starting out, but once you start to figure out your niche and where your audience most connects with you, learn more about that specific platform and just double and triple down on that platform, like customize your content, right? Um, if it's working best on Instagram and that's where you're converting the best and that's where your audience is engaging you with the most, put more time into creating high quality Instagram videos instead of trying to just create these like, you know, uh, meh videos um, and just throwing them out everywhere, right? Like take that extra time and just double down on where you're successful. But at the start, it makes sense, I think, especially with the real specific content to just throw it out there and see what works. But try to focus on Instagram or Facebook. Instagram is also really good because if your videos get a ton of traction, they'll be shown on the Facebook Reels feed, right? Because the two mm -hmm. platforms are connected. I don't know if it's the reverse from Facebook to Instagram. It might be. Um, but there's also some value there. Like TikTok, I mean, I've got like 112,000 <laughs> followers or something on TikTok and like, it's meaningless. Like I don't, I don't think about the platform at all, right? Like my 22,000 or 23,000 or whatever it is on Instagram is so much more valuable to me than the 112 on TikTok. And it's not even close. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And also like, just because you have eyeballs, views don't translate into money. That's why always, I've always said that about these when people are buy, doing media buys and they sell based on impressions when you're doing cpm stuff eyeballs don't turn into money eyeballs are just you know you can't you cannot gauge roi with eyeballs and as we said one hundred and twelve thousand followers on tiktok okay great way, way to go you know but like but is, there, is it there can money? be a balance so this is where like i've also found success is sometimes there is value in creating this like more quote unquote viral style content on a platform like Instagram. So you come up on the for you page a little bit more frequently and then you can hit people with the actual message you have, right? Like with the mm. sales message, like one of the video that we had that fundraised a ton, I had a video go super viral like five days before. And then I like piggybacked basically off that virality with a fundraising video. So there is value in like, nice. you know, combining the two together. But if you spend all of your time doing trends, for example, unless you are super unique and, you know, recognizable mm -hmm. with it, like, like Duolingo is a great example. Duolingo just does friends, does their own crazy stuff. And they're like one of the best businesses on social media. I don't know if you've seen them on there, the big green I, bird. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I, I find that they're very good. And if you ever see the liquid death videos, they, yep. they, they, liquid death, he, they're, they're like my, my muse for everything. Like they're, they're just like so insane with the way they create content. It's just not even normal. Well, you hit it perfectly though. The reason they're so effective is because they market different than every other corporation because they're not as risk averse, right? Another, so I have a good friend. He's the social media head for a company called ClickUp, right? And he's mm -hmm. on my board of directors, one of the co-founders, like awesome, awesome dude, Chris Cunningham. And we were talking about, he just had two videos that were like mega viral on social media. And it was like these guys pretending to be HR managers, like, yeah, you yeah. know, basically, yeah. So that that's, they're singing that's, and dancing. They're, they're, they're running that as a YouTube ad also. Yeah, uh, and it's 100%. And the reason it got so much traction is because it was so outside the norm of what would be considered like acceptable as corporate content that us as human beings who, you know, want the barriers to be pushed a little bit, love it, right? And that's what other, you know, that's how you get social traction, right? I bet so many people became ClickUp users instead of Monday.com users or, you yep. know, Asana, whoever their competitors are, because they're like, oh shit, these guys are humans. You know, yes. like they're, they're like me, I want to, I want to support them, you know, and, and that's kind of, it's finding that sweet spot between showcasing your value and making sure your brand is recognized and people fall in love with the work that you're doing and also getting clicks.
Well, it's also about that exactly you hit you hit it spot on. It's like raising your hand. How you have to raise your hand higher than everybody else, and you have and you know you have to be you you don't have to, you you have to be not afraid to be to do something stupid, and yep. and especially like that's I feel like a lot of nonprofits when it comes to their marketing, and I talk with a lot of people in their marketing is that they, they feel like they have to be a certain way. They have to do what everybody else is doing or they, or they, they don't know what to do because they don't know because they're so like spread thin and their, their brain is about to explode. So they're kind of lost. And like, when you just talk about thinking outside the box a little bit and just using your brain and, and channeling that creativity and seeing, okay, wait a minute, there's a million one people who are doing, who are trying to save the whales. How can I save the whales better? There are, there's, there's, there's a million one organizations out there that help sick kids. How can I help sick kids better? But it, it but it's like, it's like with a business, it's like with anything, like with, with, you know, with my software solution, with give suite, for example, there's a million and one nonprofit management and fundraising solutions out there on the market. Literally there's a million of these things. And I yep. said, they, and, and I said, they all suck. So how can I make this better? And I did because you, you put in unique things that are unique and tailored to you and to your personalities and to your brand and build that around that. And so nonprofits are, just, are nonprofits are business that don't, that don't make money. Yeah. And, well, I was going to say one thing I find really interesting too, and, and this is like a maybe a bit more anecdotal because I only have limited experience here. But one thing I think a lot of not-for-profits do is the people who are surrounded by that, you know, their organization. So the last not-for-profit I worked for was guilty of this. If you are in the organization, you're in this echo chamber of like, my organization is the best, right? Always. Like you, you think from the point of somebody who works and loves the cause, not from the consumer who has never heard about you, right? Or, mm -hmm. or does not love that cause as much oh, as I've you Oh, I've had do, this conversation right? with many people. <laughs> and, and this is super, super, like extremely important because it's where most not-for-profits get absolutely crushed. And, and I'll throw them under the bus here a little bit because I absolutely love them. But Canadian Blood Services, where I worked before, that's how they operate, right? They have some of the most incredible stories in the world, right? Like genuinely like sick kids whose lives were saved, you know, mothers whose lives were saved, fathers whose lives were saved, like, like blood donation is awesome. And I, I absolutely love this cause. It saved my life. I am such a big, passionate fan of, of them. But they, they approach their social media from everybody who's seeing this already loves us. They don't approach it from this person has never heard of us and I need to get them into the clinic to donate blood. And if they just shifted that paradigm and started a storytelling effectively and be sure. focusing on new donor recruitment instead of like, you know, kind of like cheesy stuff that the internal marketing team likes, the, the blood demand problem would be gone, right? Like people would be in the clinic. They'd build up a cult-like following. They'd have a community who absolutely loves them. And it's just like, it's you need to get out of your own head a little bit and realize you might love the work that you're doing. It might be what you think about every day because it's your job. But most people... They don't care, man. There's a lot of other great organizations out there that do exceptional, exceptional, exceptional work. Yeah. And from a consumer's yeah. perspective, how, how are you going to choose, right? Like, like you've got so many things. Just because you love sick kids, let's say, doesn't mean you have to love blood service. Like, it, you know what I mean? Like, it's... Yeah. I, I you, my, The first question I always ask organizations before they start working with us is, what makes you so special? Why should I give a shit about you? Like, as, as, a, as an outsider... Why should I care about you? Please tell me, sell me. And like, mm -hmm. and it, it, again, if you can't ans ask that question, understanding like what, ma why, what makes you different? What makes you unique? You're not going to be able to market effectively. You're not going to be able to put out content effectively. And you're not going to be able to go out there and, and bring in the, the money that you want because, and, and you know, you know what makes every not-for-profit unique? Like what every not-for-profit has in their arsenal that's a uniqueness is their patient stories, man. Like that's yeah. literally like all that matters. If, if all you did was promote your patient stories nonstop every day, yep. you would make money fundraising on social media. Like, like yep. no education pieces of content, no trends, no anything. If you just told the same story over every day a little bit different, you yeah. probably you fundraise a few thousand dollars a month at least if the story was well told right yeah and like i i just 
we, we overcomplicate the process and I'm guilty of this myself sometimes too. Like it's, it's hard to, you know, just, just do that. Right. There's obviously barriers to success there, but just tell, show the work that you're doing, tell the stories. Like that's, that's what the audience cares about. They, they don't care about, you know, a lot of the stuff, like they, they care about people and that's what well, we have. Well, that's kind of how, when I see a lot of successes with our email campaigns is because it's all about patient stories it's all about client like user stories and like when we see open rates and high open rates high click rates and high conversion rates on the emails it's because we're focusing on the stories and that's that's what it's all about because no one cares about you people care about the stories people care about who you're helping how you're doing it and the impact that these people like i have one organization working with they're one of the largest organizations in in israel they've been around longer than i've been alive they help sick kids and their families who are struggling who are dealing with cancer and the stories that they have it's all about the story it's all about the kids it's all about who like they have one story about this kid who was who was this is like their one of their flagship stories they they take these kids to camp they're actually in camp right now in holland they do like three or four camps a year and this one kid he was 12 years old he was sick with cancer he couldn't they couldn't get him out of bed couldn't get him to eat couldn't do anything he was just like i'm dying screw this like literally he's like i'm dying like what do i care and they the the guy who started the man who founded the organization he's like he calls him up he drove to his house to pick and he's like come on we're going to camp we're going we're going to england and he's like no i don't want to go and he's like come on we're going and he's like we're going to get you on the plane with 100 other kids and we're going to go have the time of your life and so this kid goes to camp and he 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 has he goes in and they have this massive barbecue and this kid literally has not eaten for months he's like eating out of a feeding tube because he has no energy he isn't the kid pounds like three steaks and and then he starts dancing then he starts going doing all the activities like there's pictures of the kid shooting bows and arrows like dancing up a storm comes back his parents didn't even recognize him they're like where's my kid and they're like you know this is and and this and and this kid he beat the cancer you know this these are like stories that you know you cry people like you see it and people are just like holy crap and you know when i heard this story i was blown away but like this is one of like a million th- stories like these guys like i said these guys have been around for like 35 years so this is one of like a million stories but their focus is on the stories and they make money. Yep. It, it, it's, it's literally, it's why children's hospitals and children's specific not-for-profits are so effective, man. Like it's the like, same thing here, like the children's hospital of Eastern Ontario, awesome team there, knock everyone out of the water. Right. And like, it's not always that people want to support them. It's that they have a family in mind. They have a kid that they meet. They like, that's, it, it's what people want to be a part of, right? Like they want yeah. to be a part of the change in somebody's life not the organization's bottom line, right? Um, if people want to help people, I guess, at the end of the day. And, and, you know, a lot of people are probably going to hear that and think like, oh, well, like, that's so easy because they're just, they're, they have kids' stories and people love kids' stories. And, you know, people no, kind of create these excuses why they can't do it. That's it, right? And it's like, you know, I'll give you another example. And it's, you know, maybe it, whatever. It's, it's just a topic. When I got shot, the people who shot me, their skin color was black. They were black guys, right? But also the woman who saved my life and compressed my wound was a black woman. And one of the most viral videos I have on social media was me saying, someone asked me, were the shooters black? And I was like, yeah, the people who shot me were black, but also like the people who saved my life were black. One of my surgeons was black, like skin color, man. Like it's not that deep, right? And a lot of people would shy away from making a video like that because it's polarizing, bro. Like there's 40,000 comments or more on that video. Half of them are people like celebrating me. Half of them are people just absolutely tearing me to shreds. But you know what that video did? The next video fundraised a shitload of money, right? So like we have this risk aversion when it comes to creating content and we're afraid of telling stories. But if I was a, a charity, so I've got this charity I did a course with and he basically is this black guy who goes into inner cities and teaches black kids math. I absolutely love the work that he does. I think it's awesome. I'm, I'm obviously not a black guy. It's not like something that directly has impacted me, but I think that's so cool, right? Because I love that these kids are, are learning. I think it's something that's really important. And like, if he went out there and put that story online and told it effectively, you know what would happen? Half the people in the comments would roast him. Half the people in the comments would love him. All of them would contribute to that algorithm and blow his message up. 
right? Yep. Talking about these like universally like quote unquote like polarizing things where you get these angry people behind keyboards who are like bickering at each other. What that does is it blows your message message up. It helps to get to the right people, and then your bottom line pays like gets the benefit from it, right? So like we have these organizations who are so afraid of the micro segments of the population who say these mean things, and they actually just end up not putting out content, not sharing things. And then, or not creating quality content that's going to do well. And you know who pays the price for that is the people they actually want to help, right? Yeah. So I know we're kind of like, we're closing in. We don't have too, too much time left, but I really wanted to make that point there is yeah. like, people are too risk averse with this stuff. And I, I get it from like a liability perspective and like, you know, what whatever, you know, people want to look at from there. But if you really care about the people that you support, Say the thing that some people are going to not like and some people are going to like, but you actually personally value a ton because that's yeah. going to be the thing that pushes you over the, the edge. But I think it's also like, who cares? Honestly, like who, who, who cares? Like who cares? If, yeah. people, like, it, uh, if, if everybody cared about what everybody thought, then, then no, no one would do anything ever. And you look yep. at the people who are successful and you look at the people who are like the, the amount of craps they give about what people say about them and care. I mean, for goodness sakes, like Elon Musk, right? Like yep. the, the, the man just gives like zero craps about anything. And, 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 and he is extremely successful, you know, like all these people, you know, so if you, and I think that's a, the, in a nonprofit also, you have to stop like w- thinking about what everybody else is doing and focus on you, you do you. And then uh, I always tell people also, you do you, we'll help, we'll take care of the rest. You know, you just got to do you. And I think everything you said today was extremely powerful. And I think that everything that we've talked about is huge, especially when you're dealing with a smaller kind of startup organization, grassroots type of situation where money's tight and you don't really have budgets to hire guys like me and which is okay. This is okay. You'll get there eventually. But, you know, it's creating content that resonates with your people and understanding the principles of this type of stuff is, is, make, is makes all the difference in the world. So, Brandon, I really appreciate you, dude. I really appreciate you coming down on the show and the fact that we connected and there's a lot in store with this. Um, I'm definitely grateful. So I'm going to for everybody who wants to learn more about Brandon, I'm going to drop his information into the show notes. You can be able to connect with Brandon and learn more about his organization. Go out there and make a donation. He's got a couple different campaigns rolling on this one now stay tuned for some really big stuff in the works for brandon if you're a nonprofit founder and looking to learn and grow and if you want to learn more about give suite you can schedule your complimentary strategy session with me today link is in the show notes and don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast and all major podcasting platforms and until next week guys i will catch you all on the next upload it's been a blast my friend Hey, I appreciate it, man. I, I usually talk so much about my story. Getting to talk about the business side of things is something I'm, I'm so passionate about. So I appreciate you for giving me the opportunity to do that. My pleasure. All the best.